In this section, we'll go through some of the most common plot types and their common arguments. Bar plots are good for categorical data, where you want to represent the count. So again, we always start with our ggplot object, or function. The first argument is the data table where we want to get our data. Most people omit the argument name data. The second argument is our mapping. We also usually omit the mapping and just type the AES function straight into ggplot. So what we want to represent here along the x-axis is the pet types from the table pets. Now remember, if we just run this, it sets us up um, a blank plot. Now we need to tell it what sort of visualization we want. Now, I said bar plots is what we're going to do. So we start with, it with geom underscore bar. And that will give us bars that represent the count. How many rows are there of each type in the data table pets. Now we can copy this whole code chunk here, paste it down there, and look at a different type of plot to plot. Um, instead of categorical data, continuous data, so score. We can't do that with a bar plot. We'll get, well, we can. It looks a bit like a histogram here. Um, but if instead we want a density plot, we just use geom density. So this is a, a curve that represents the proportion of um, values or rows that have that particular score. Yeah. You can also plot um, things like a density plot for each level of a categorical factor. So we can represent um, this categorical factor of pet, the different pet types, by different fill colors. So we can set fill equals pet inside the mapping for ggplot. If we run that, then each pet type, dog, cat, or ferret, gets a different fill color. Now, it's kind of hard to see what's going on with the dogs here since they're behind cats and ferrets. So we can tell GM density that um, this GM needs to be more transparent. Or we can set the alpha here to 0.5, let's say. And now these are more transparent and we can see them a bit better. Alternately, we could have instead set the color, that is the line color, as pet. Now, they don't have any fill at all, so alpha doesn't matter, but we have different line colors for each category. Yeah. Now, instead of um, density plots, you can use, um, whereas a density plot, the y-axis is kind of hard to understand what density means. You really just need to focus on the relative differences. There are many more... Um, cats that score 90 than cats that score 70. Um, but we can use another function called frequency polygons or FERQ poly. Um, we're still going to represent the score and the color is pet. And this gets us um, sort of jagged lines representing the count how many dogs scored exactly 80 or 100 here. Um, we can change, it gives us a warning up here. It says stat bin using bins equals 30, pick better value with bin width. What that means is that much like a histogram, this lumps your continuous data into 30 different bins. We can say um, that we want the bin width equal to one. So for every one integer, you'll get a representation here. Now that's quite jagged. If you want to smooth that out, you can make the bin width a bit bigger. Let's say we'll round everything to the nearest five. And we can see a bit of a smoother 
path. So it looks much like this very smooth density function. Those are always totally smoothed out, but they're also about the same height. They're only plotting relative density within each category, whereas this plot plots the count. So the y-axis will make a bit more sense, but it can also represent the fact that there are many fewer ferrets than dogs in the whole data set. Now, which one you want to plot really depends on what kind of point you're trying to make with your data. Histograms are also good for continuous variables. These are applied with geom histogram. Let's just set the x-axis to score right now. With geom histogram, it will give you the same bin width argument. So let's set the bin width to 5 again. In ggplot, histograms are kind of ugly. I always like to set the fill and color. Now before we set the fill in the aesthetic mappings, if we wanted the fill to represent some sort of category in your data, then you would put it up here in the aesthetic mappings. But if you don't want it to represent data, but just simply be a property of the histogram, we want all of the bars to be white, we can set fill equals white here. So it doesn't need to be in the aesthetic mapping if it's just a fixed value instead of saying that fill is going to represent what kind of pet or what country they're from. Fill is just going to be white for everything. And we'll set color, that's the line color, equal to black. This is my favorite type of default histogram with light bars and dark outlines. If you want to group your histograms together, let's say instead we're going to set um, fill to what type of pet they are, we can take out this fill equals white, and if you run that, it'll stack the histograms on top of each other. If you don't want that to happen, inside of histogram you can use the position argument. So set position equals dodge and this will dodge them out of the way of each other and you can see this is very much like the frequency polygon that we have that just trace the tops of the bars here this can sometimes be hard to read so you'll need to decide what your data look like um, which kind you want to use will depend on how much data you have, how many categories you have, how spread out the data are. Um, you can try different options for representing the same data. So you're probably wondering why we haven't yet created a column plot. Now, this is one of the more common types of plots that you see in papers, probably because it's an easy one, default to create in Excel. It's actually not a very good representation of most data. Um, really column plots are the worst way to represent grouped continuous data. But they're one of the most common and if you're wanting to do things like replicate a paper using R so that you have a computationally reproducible version and your supervisor says you still have to have bar plots, I will show you how to do them. So if your data are already summarized, you have a column for means and standard errors, you can just use the, um, the geom cal function. But usually you'll be starting with data that aren't grouped yet, that you haven't calculated the mean yet. So we're going to learn a different um, type of function called stat summary. But again, let's start ggplot, our pets table, and our mapping. So we want the x-axis to be pet, the pet type, and the y-axis to be score. People usually leave x and y out of here. As long as you put them in in that order, the AES function knows that you mean the first one is x, the second one is y. You have to name all of the other um, properties though. So let's represent, use fill color Oops, to be pet as well. 
So along the x-axis will be the different pets, but each pet will also be a different color. So you can represent the same data in two different ways as well. This can help you to represent data clearly by matching colors across different graphs, but also having a secondary backup way to represent pet as different columns, maybe for um, black and white printing or colorblind participants. So we've got our base plot, no data yet. Um, and we can use here the stat summary function. Now the stat summary function runs a function on your data to create summary values that you can then use in another geom. Um, this is the easiest way to make um, column plots. So here the function that we're going to run is mean. We want to calculate the mean for our y our y-axis variable for each value of our x-axis pet. Um, and we also need to tell it what kind of geom we want. So what sort of graphical representation should we make of the mean? There are many different choices, and I'll show you some better choices later. But right now we're going to look at geom cow. So we'll make a column plot. OK, so this gives us um, the mean scores for our dogs, cats, and ferrets. Um, I almost always like to set the alpha to 0.5 for things that have a fill. I just think it looks a bit nicer. Um, but what about error bars? We can also use stat summary to calculate error bars. Oops. OK. So here. Instead of the function, we want we need to use fun data because this is going to give us um, multiple values, not just um, where we set the y-axis, the y-value for our columns, but also where we're going to set the y-minimum and y-maximum for error bars. Um, and we can use a function that's built into ggplot called mean underscore se that calculates the mean and the standard errors. Um, specifically for your typical error bars. So the geom we're going to use is the error bar geom. So that gives us error bars that go one standard error above and below the mean for each of our groups. These are awfully wide, so we can change their width. And let's make it sort of 25% of the width of our bars. And we also see that these seem, they look really, really tiny because our scores are quite high and we're starting our axis at zero. Now, this may or may not make sense to start the axis at zero, but let's say, hypothetically, we want to start our y-axis at 80 because, say, 80 is the minimum score that pets could possibly get on this test. We can use another layer of our ggplot to set the Cartesian coordinates. Um, this gives a limit to where we're going to show our graph and y-axis we can set it from say 80 to 120. So we want to change, truncate the y-axis. So we're going to use the function coord Cartesian um, and set ylim. So the limits of the y-axis are the vector 80 comma 120. So all this tells us is that the y-axis, we're going to start it at 80 and we're going to stop it at 120. Run that. And here we can see a sort of more traditional column plot. Now like I had said, column plots are one of the worst ways to represent your data. Often, our studies have shown that people believe that values that are inside of these boxes are more likely than values above the boxes, even though this is the mean. A value above and below should be equally likely. Um, also, when you truncate the axes, you can make the relative sizes of your different values look incredibly different in very misleading ways. Um, so if you don't want to mislead the readers of your papers, 
you can use other types of plots. So an alternative is to use box plots. Now we can do ggplot pets pet score fill equals pet. Have a look at our base plot. And we can add on GM box plot. So here we have a plot that represents the median, the interquartile means, um, and outliers. Another one of my favorite ways to represent data is with the violin plot. So the violin plot is much like a box plot, but instead of just showing the median and interquartile range, it shows the, the entire um, range of data and the density of each, um, each score. So they're just like density plots, but turned on their side and mirrored. You can also set um, an argument in GM Violin, draw quantiles. And so you can draw the median, or you could draw um, the median in the interquartile range. So at these different quantiles by setting this to a vector of three different quantile values. But box plots and violin plots don't always map well onto the inferential stats that use the mean. Now you can represent mean and standard or any other value that you can calculate with vertical intervals. So we're going to create here some data that have the means and standard errors for two different groups. So we use the tibble function to create a quick data set. We have two groups. Uh, groups will be A and B. The groups have means. Mean of group A is 10, mean of group B is 20. And we'll set the standard errors for each group. Standard error of group A will be 2 and 3 for group B. Okay, so we've created that tiny data set. It just looks like this. Um, Now we can set our base plot. Now we've been just typing in the base plot each time, but you can also set it to a variable if you're going to use this base plot more than once. So we'll create an object called gg and make that the gg plot for our new little data set. And we'll set the aesthetic mappings here. So we want our x-axis to be the group our y-axis to be the mean. And we have two new aesthetics here. So when you're looking at vertical intervals, um, you want the y-axis minimum and maximum as well. So we set y-min is equal to the mean minus standard error. Put that on a new row. And y-max equals the mean plus the standard error. Okay, so we've set this gg object to our base plot. If we just type that in, we can see we've got a base plot here. Now let's explore a few different ways we can represent vertical intervals. Okay. So one is with a crossbar. So we take our base plot object and we can add geom crossbar. This gives us a crossbar at the mean and then a box surrounding the y min and y max, so our standard errors. We could also use error bar. Oops, we need to call it geom error bar. So again, this gives us um, a vertical bar that has horizontal bars at the y min and the y max. It doesn't represent the mean. You would need to add on another um, geom to represent the mean. Let's try geom point. That'll give us a mean at the x at the y value. We can use um, geom line range. 
that just gives us a plain line that doesn't have the error bar caps. You can make GM error bar look exactly like line range if you set width equals zero, or you can just use line range. We'd set width to about 0.25 to make those shorter, or line range just gives you the plain lines. Now there's a quick function called GM point range that gives you all of that together. So a line range plus a point all together. So these four different ways to represent vertical intervals. I would argue give you a better way to show people where's the mean and what's a reasonable interval around it. You can plot standard error, you could plot standard deviation if that's relevant, or things like 95% confidence intervals. And again, you can use the function stat summary to calculate things like mean or standard error or any other value for your data. Now let's talk about what we do with um, multiple continuous factors. So a scatter plot. Now scatter plots are a good way to represent the relationship between two continuous variables. So let's start with ggplot for pets and decide what what variable do you want to plot along the x-axis? Let's plot age along the x-axis and weight along the y-axis. See, we've set up our plot correctly. Now we can add a geom to it. So geom point just gives you a point at the um, location of each combination of age and weight. Here we can see all of the points. If we want to represent the different pet types with um, the color of these dots, we can set color equals pet. And now the points are color coded. We can also represent this with shape. You give each one a different shape. The shapes are really hard to see when they're this close together. So you can set both shape and color to represent the pet type. And that gives you two methods to distinguish the points, both shape and color. Some will work better in some places, like in a black and white image versus not, or might give additional help to people who have certain types of color blindness. Now, you probably want to plot the regression line through these, these points. So let's add in a regression line you would think you would use GM line, and I used to do this all the time. Let's have a look at this. What it actually does is draw a line between each um, point in your data set in the order that they are in your data set. This looks ridiculous. Um, the actual function you want to be using is called smooth, GM smooth. Now, if you don't give it any arguments, it assumes you want to use the LOAS method to create a line, and this gives you a kind of wavy line that best fits your data. Whoops, let's run that. And it will also give you a confidence interval here. That's almost never what you actually want. Um, so you can change the defaults. Here, you can see it tells you that it's using the defaults method equals low s and formula equals y being predicted by x. So we can keep the default formula y predicted by x and let's use the linear method. So set method equal to lm. We're going to create a linear model and plot that for each, each pet type. This gives you your regression line through your data. If you want to get rid of this um, standard error shading, you can set alpha equals zero. But usually I find that useful to have. In the next section, we'll learn how to customize our plots.